Okay, it's another draw splaining. This time I'm gonna do um, a different style, not cartoony. I do a sort of science fiction drawing with cross hatching, and uh, it's like a giant robot theme. Dead giant robot in the valley, the valley of the shattered. So what I've done in this case is uh, done a little quick sketch. I did a really quick sketch here, kind of a scribble. I used a notepad, but my first thought, I thought, what if I have a giant robot leaning against the stump of something? Maybe it's a rock, actually. Could have been a tree. And uh, I've got, like, distant kind of monuments, and maybe a figure here, the moon, night. And we sort of see his hand. <clears throat> and I just did a quick sketch. In this case, I did a preparatory sketch, but very roughly with my chunky pencil. And uh, I just kind of blocked it in. It's a little smudgy on this paper. Let's hope it works with the ink. But I'm going to just improvise around the rest of it. As you can see, I changed some of the elements a bit in size. Like um, this was too small and disjointed. So I made the moon more dominant. And I'm going to have a dark sky here and some mist. And I'm just going to start. So I'm going to concentrate first on, <coughs> excuse me, blocking in. The, the major outlines and then I'm going to hone in probably on the lighting and then work towards the hatching and cross hatching. So um, I'm going to see how this goes. It's like a, uh, what are these called? Optiflow? I don't know. It's this pseudo fountain pen. And um, see how it goes on this paper. This is like a piece of bond paper. But what I'm trying to remember here is I can be kind of sketchy. And uh, I'm just going to test the smudginess of this. It's not smudging. Um, be kind of sketchy and loose is what I always try and tell myself. Don't bog down. And if I sketch in things I can not commit to completely, unless I feel like it, I can usually get away with it because I'm going to put hatching on top of this. I don't like this cap, so I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm going to go in with my main lines. Because the robot's really dominant, I'm going to start in on him. Actually, this, this uh, pencil, I don't know if it shows in the video, it's smudging like crazy, but that doesn't matter. We'll erase it later. Mr. Robot feels like he needs more technology here, so I'm going to add some fins, fin, fin type things. He's supposed to be a dead robot, so I can make some of it. Um, some of it can be like broken. Some of it I pause because I'm kind of trying to feel my way. I think about how to give it some interest without getting too fussy. Already gonna put some dark in here because I'm gonna remind myself to the deeper parts, crevices. This is like the socket of the arm. I want darks in there. No matter what the lighting is, it's gonna be dark in there. Unless someone shined a spotlight or something in there directly. So this is the remnants of his arm. And I'm gonna make this part of the arm like as if sort of like the bones almost, like the inner part, then whatever skin is gone. So uh, we might see some of the mechanism <clears throat> and um, here I'm just starting to suggest and what I find is if I, if I don't lock it in too much early then I can almost improvise around that like once I have a starting point it's easier to build on top of that than uh, just go right into the final Almost like that principle of when you correct someone else's drawing or critique it, it's easier to see. Or when you go over pencil. So even with the ink, I'm, I'm doing like one pass. And uh, then I'll go, I might go back in on it when I've got more blocked in. But that's enough for here for now. I'm going to have some kind of joint here. And I've even got these pencil scribbles, which I'm, are helping suggest items to me.
in all of this, as I draw, I'm, I'm thinking of the three-dimensional form and the perspective, like we've got a low angle here, horizon's down here, and we're looking up, so I'm going to try and keep the sense of that. I'm always trying to think of thicknesses, like how thick is this? So I've shown the whatever fin this is here on his shoulder, you see the side of it and the front of it and the side of it. He was trying to communicate 3D form. And I'm thinking here, like maybe what if he had, um, if it's a he, it had a, I'm trying to think about the lighting, what kind of light on its chest. This part's broken. This would be like implying a rib cage since it seems to be a humanoid kind of robot. And I'm gonna keep rolling in here with the form. This is almost implying some kind of spine. Which is all that creepy, but it looks like he's bent a bit. I've left these gaps because I've got this cable thing here. And then I'm going to go back in here. Sometimes you can draw like this. See, I'm not lifting the pen off the paper. It's just one long line. And that can have an interesting result too. I'm sort of improvising forms here quickly. And like I said earlier, I'm going to go in, <clears throat> go in and add lighting on top of this layer. This is just the line version now. And as I said, it's like kind of like this. Robots lost his skin. These would be like some kind of attachment ribs that are left over. And it makes a nice silhouette there, see? Gives it some interest. And then I've got like almost like the tendons are just hanging on here of this poor old robot. Giant robot. Dead giant robots. It's a whole theme. See, these are going out in perspective a little. It's not super close to us, so um, it's not coming right at like widely divergent, but I've just diverged these three a little bit. And uh, let's do like as if it's a three-fingered robot. I got four sections here. One, two, three, four. That's what they built in this robot. One, two, three. And I'm going to have this like sand, so it's almost like it's digging in the sand here. This is just to get the form in, based on this pencil lay-in I'm going to add probably to that. Like I've said in my other videos, the challenge always is with this kind of drawing, any kind of drawing is, when do you stop? You know, how much do you do? How detailed, how noodly, as somebody once called it. Um, but a lot of that has, to, the decision with that has to do with you're trying to make a focal point, so I'm trying to make this robot's one focal point, probably sweeping up to looking at his face. And then there's the other one here of this soldier or something. I'm going to have him like coming out of the mist, carrying a weapon. So that gives it presumably some story interest, like it's the moment where he's about to notice behind this. Like we can see, we as the viewers can see this robot, but uh, he, this person coming up probably hasn't noticed it yet. 
and uh, it's probably dead, but you never know, so that's kind of adding suspense. I'm adding in already some contact, sort of deep shadows, like if this is a rock, it's the... Uh, It's the, what would you call the cast shadow, suggestion of a cast shadow. And uh, like I said here, you can be a little bit not that fussy. What you find with these kind of drawings is, it's a really hard thing to learn, which is don't finish everything to the same level of detail. It's exactly like if you look at famous paintings, like say John Singer Sargent or any, any classical, I love John Singer Sargent, but uh, you, you notice that they don't finish every uh, part of the painting to the same degree because it's actually counterintuitive. And in John Singer Sargent paintings, typically, which is classical painting, around the focal point, you get a lot chunkier, rougher, almost like unfocused brush strokes, but beautiful. And then they, they really go in detail um, and tighten it up near the focal point. And so the same principle can kind of apply here with... Um, I'm pausing because my brain beach balls. <laughs> Same thing applies with pen drawing. And you look at famous pen dra um, drawings by artists that knew about that. They would not finish every part of it to the same degree. Because your eye kind of tends to over, it's overkill. It kills your eye like you, you want some relief sometimes. All right. Um, I want to have a suggestion of ribs here. I based this on my good old model I showed in my other video of my rib cage. I made like, I just took a quick look at this. This is like a balsa wood model I carved myself back in the 80s of the rib cage, but it's always handy to remember. Um, all right. I'm telling myself to get back to work. Now, do I have a thickness here showing? Probably. And, uh, What's in this little? Like I said, it's always a thing about how much detail and fussiness. You want a bit because you've got to give the the reader, the viewer, some interest. But on the other hand, you don't want to completely uh, get get everything too fussy. You need the big effect. I'm trying to decide how to do this other hand here because I've got a bit of this rock coming down here behind here but then it's like his other arm is going to come back around so his, the other part of his arm is probably going back here and I'll try and find some kind of pattern to suggest that we know it's robot arm not rock so I put that little kind of thing almost like these things over here if you can see that and uh, then I've got his hand And um, I'm just kind of roughly chunking in the silhouette. It's like a creepy, kind of broken hand. I'll probably make that mostly dark. And now do we need something here, probably in terms of form Former function. Like I said, I'm making this up as I go along, so it's kind of a, uh, that's the fun of it, right? Let's make some panels here. And uh, let's suggest some kind of structure, you know, like if this was built, there might be a seam here some rivets are always fun. I'm going to work in some of the darks and then go to the face just to keep the graphic patterns like the darks will really form a a composition of their own, like where you put, put big chunky shapes of dark. So in the back, and the darks could be like in the shadows here, or they could be cast shadows. I'm always trying to keep in mind like 
where that's going to go. This could be sort of an ambient light because, in fact, he's behind the rock. The, I'm going to probably do a rim lighting effect if I can make that work. But there's like a secondary just cast sh sh shadows behind him here. And I'll probably would have this. Uh... Okay, let's get some of this in here. I'm thinking about the form of this rock. And again, I'm thinking about like volume. I think about rockiness, you know, like craggy. Craggy cracks. And uh, that would probably have a shadow coming down more like this now. All right. It's a lot of talking to myself as I do it. Sometimes cursing. I haven't done one of these style drawings for a while, and it's a real counterpoint to drawing like cartoony. My other draw explaining videos are just like cartoony outline drawings where you're just thinking about lines and shapes. You're thinking about forms, but you're not thinking about rendering. And um, this is a bit of a different creature. Plus the science fiction element, of course. Like it's a different, what do you call it? Vernacular might, might be the word. It's a different language of. Shapes, you're trying to think of cool science fiction-y elements. Um, all right, let's get to the head. Start with the eye socket, which is dark. That makes it creepy. Almost like a plate there. And the remnants of teeth. It's a sort of giant humanoid. And you can suggest almost like a jawbone. Hinged jawbone, tilting it so I can see the angle properly. Yeah, let's make it almost a bit humanoid, like there's a hinge here. And uh, kind of somewhat reminiscent of a human. And then again, reminiscent, we'll put some kind of like uh, ear as if there is like a ear hole for the sound or something, I don't know. And then, uh, skull. Should we have it broken, kind of like he got shot? And, um, if you hear that sound a moment ago in the background, it's my demented cat, Winston. He was n intent on clawing the last shreds of my old wingback chair into non-existence. As cats will do, anybody who has cats knows cats will do that. But, um... I'll spare you my further thoughts about cats here. These would almost be like the cords of neck muscles. And like I said earlier, a bit of sketchiness is always okay. As long as you don't go too crazy and lose the form. But if you get some, it's nice because it gives you uh, the viewer's eye and mind, whatever, you know, some involvement. Because if everything is completely, totally dialed in at every point, at least uh, that's what I find, it's just too much. If you look at, uh, well, I don't have, I'm not going to do an edited video, so I'm not going to add it in here. But if you look at older pen illustrators from the heyday of pen illustration, um, 
what is it, like Charles Dana Gibson and uh, who else? My mind's blanking. Frank Reynolds, E.H. Shepard, who did the Winnie the Pooh famous drawings. All, all kinds of them. There's so many. They actually were very informal in some places. If you look at their their drawings, they're um, impeccably composed and drawn in terms of knowledge of anatomy and composition, but the actual penmanship is very loose in a lot of places. Places you can see they're just winging away and very free as the inspiration carried them along. So you have to kind of try and get some of that because it gives the drawing life. Whereas for me, when I see inking that's, I've done it, so that's why I know when it's too completely nailed in um, and doesn't have a little bit of that looseness and abandon and life, then it doesn't have life. It's sort of dead. It's like a mechanical drawing, you know, a drafting drawing, like, and, um, I don't know, it just reduces the appeal. That's what I always liked about Mobius and particularly Miyazaki's manga, like Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Uh, the manga he did, just incredible. Very loose. And all his production drawings. I really actually value uh, Miyazaki over Mobius, personally. I think he's, if you want to get into unsolicited opinions for the drawstring, um, I think he's a greater artist, even though Mobius, Mobius is very great and they respected each other. And there's probably no need to really, you know, differentiate between like who's greater. But uh, I just think what Miyazaki has accomplished in his films and his whole world of it, what, it's just staggering. When you think that he also had a staff and he's creating all these films and directing the animation and putting it all together. And then at some points in his life when he did Nausicaa, I think he was actually also doing this manga while he was doing one of, one of the films. It might have been even Nausicaa. Um, I'm going to get myself to deal with some of these things. Not procrastinate from drawing the big picture. This is supposed to simply be some kind of background mountain. And... Uh, This is mist. I'm gonna tell myself to be a bit more free with it. I'm using my whole arm as a unit. If you want to get technical, I'm not doing with fussy little finger things. I'm just kind of keeping my, like moving my whole arm or in this way, going away from myself to get parallel lines. Is my pen dying? I hope not. Switch to another one and see if it helps. a little better. I should probably use a dip pen one of these days, but and uh, what you're trying to do is get attention here. I'm going to probably put some dark in the sky. I haven't really decided. And um, let's just see. 23 minutes. I'm always keeping track of the time here because I, I'm doing this on my iPhone and I don't want to get like two hour videos because there's trouble getting them uploaded and out of my phone. Um, anyway. All right, let's see now. We're going to have this moon. Can get away with making it a little bit wobbly because... I'm going to make it sort of uh, dark in here. Let's get some, uh, bash in some lighting here. Probably want some of this to be dark because I don't want the viewer's eye to go off this side of the page. This pen is not cooperating the way I'd like it. That one's better. Now what I'm thinking of is the shadows, as if this rock wall is... Uh, this is the side of it, and it's pointing, as you can see, just directly pointing down towards the guy. That's intentional. I mean, that's classic uh, composition. And I'm now doing a secondary one, but I'm varying it because if you look at nature, things 
very it's tapering out here you can't just make it rigidly the same so you're trying to it's really tricky to get that rhythm of nature but nature definitely has a varied rhythm to it and a balance that you want in your drawing like here I want I just and it's kind of partly on feeling I want this to uh, close off there and I'm going to carry this through this mist as if it's It's fading out as if the mist is getting thicker. You see, this is lighter. And, uh, all right, good enough for now. Let's go over here and get some lighting in on this. So it's the moon, and this is like almost a sand pile in the foreground. And his hand has gone over too. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to add this shadow crossing over this hand from it's as if there's a light that's coming out just a bit over here and it's casting casting onto these rocks i'll probably adjust this a lot more as i go and then what i'm going to do is add dark shadows to this side more And I'm scribbling here because I like it. It's a quick way of getting hatching in, but it's just a style I like doing. You can always cross over it after, which I might do. Um, but it's a good way of bashing in darks, but in this style, giving it some kind of hatchy feeling. And I've made it like this rock is sticking out a bit here, so I've got to make the shadow go back behind it a bit like that. Just to make it believable. Probably get away with lightening it a bit here because I'm implying that it's a misty night. And, uh... Maybe the mist is coming up a bit here, so it's um, lightening up there. Again, all this stuff is subject to adjustment after I get around and keep reminding myself to bash in the big stuff. Because if you lock in on one area too much, you're not balancing out the whole drawing, which is really what you want to do. I mean, that's the whole art of it is that you're drawing each piece, but you're also trying to keep an eye, uh, an eye on the whole. So it's the part in the whole. You're, you're drawing um, each element, but you want to see it in relation to each other part of the drawing and try and make a balanced whole. Here I'm thinking about this being the shadow under his arm, of his arm, and uh, Almost like there's a tiny bit of a reflected light here. I'm going to leave it lighter for a second. And then I'm going to half tone it here by crossing and then going into dark. So this makes like a transition, a tapering. Here I'm just going to make it like there's a raised seam here. And let's turn the form here. Taper it off towards the light. And I'm going to go against it to make a core shadow here. And again, it's like there's reflected light coming back off this. And I think right now, overall, what I want to do is two things. Get some rocks in and then go back to the robot. Just balance this. looked a bit too empty. What you're trying to do is make a flow that where you carry your eye around 
you don't have a dead spot where your eye stops. Because you don't want the viewer to just stop at the wrong spot. That's the art of it. So here now I need a core shadow like I did here. I need some kind of... Make this a bit patchy, like it's broken. Maybe he's like got bullet holes or dents, you know, he's been dinged in the battle. Let's make this a form because it looks to me because of the seam, like it should have a different shadow to it. Now I'm going to go up this way and uh, what do I need? I need some shadowing here. It's away from the light. Get those core shadows in on this part again too. Shadow behind this to keep consistent on this cable, it's casting a shadow. And then get the core shadows. I'm turning my hand so I can throw the line away from me, like this way. going at an angle to make enough uh, all right there's always more to do keep moving is the idea of keep marching do not bog down is the rule because that's when you get yourself in deeper trouble, when your wheels dig and you, you spin the tires and you, just like with a Jeep or whatever, you, you, you dig the wheels in more if you gun the engine and keep spinning. So just go somewhere else for a bit and usually you'll figure out some answer. Or at least not make the problem worse. Um, so, okay, so here I'm going to get into more of these shadows. And I'm going to go over the hand of this robot. Oh yeah, I forgot to do that. I think this needs to be darker. Let's go this way. I'm getting some real blacks in here just to punch it in a bit more. It's going to take a bit to build this up, but let's suggest more of these rocks here now by getting some line work in here that goes against this. And I'm adding darks into these little shadows. I'm um, sorry, dark <laughs> shadows. Darks into these uh, little areas where you would not have any light reaching. Here I'm just cleaning up this edge so that it 
registers cleanly there. And this is bugging me as well. This part can be smooth, it doesn't matter if some parts are clean and some parts are really dirty. Carry this along here. Because it's getting closer, I'm spacing the lines out wider and I'm letting myself get the a little more rough and chunky and pressing down hard on the pen. Gives me a bit of a wider line, that's okay, because it's a variety like I was talking about earlier. You don't have to make everything exactly the same. In fact, in pen work, you want different patterns and things to show up. Um, you don't want just exactly the same in every every part of the drawing, because again, it gets, it looks sort of fussy. Just making sure it's not smudging. Okay. Now I'm gonna work on this here. Because these are closer, I'm just letting them go wider and more spaced out. And I do my best while I do these to have fun, relax and have fun. Keep moving, keep looking at the hole jump around a bit. It's a bit kind of intuitive. There's no set thing and really you have to just do a lot of them and fail a lot, fail upwards until you succeed. Great thing is if it doesn't work, you just do more. It's just lines on paper. That's what I always tell myself. Don't get too attached to it. Actually, isn't the greatest piece of paper I've chosen. You probably, you people, uh, people, sorry, you, you viewers in video land can't see, but it's kind of like a, a bit soft, this paper. I need a better quality Strathmore. This is like one of those Bristol drawing pads you buy, and it's a little bit kind of soggy. Complaints. Let's get this hand in. It's a bit further away, so I'm going to make it a little rougher joints. But it can almost be afford to be silhouetted more. Maybe the light's not. The light's not hitting it that much. Okay. And the mist is making it go into the darkness as a form, as an outline. So 
And that's why I'm treating it that way. You don't have to have a bright light on everything. You're like the lighting director. You're trying to imply realism enough to make it uh, believable. You're trying to sell it to the viewer where their eye goes, oh yeah, that looks good. It, it looks believable, but you're trying to avoid uh, anything that just blatantly screams like bad or fake or, you know, whatever. Which is not always easy to avoid, but that's the whole challenge. That's why we do this, right? Trying to make believable dreams. Trying to adjust the shape of this hand, it's kind of bugging me. Let's put this to round it out. That looks a little better. Let's get some form here. So this is all done in a sort of a Mobius E crosshatchy pen style. I don't even like to say Mobius because I'm not particularly trying to get exactly his look. It's a very classic um, hatching style that he dis uh, didn't discover. He applied to science fiction and comic drawings, but it's something that, again, if I did an edited video, I'd show you, but people can look it up. Look at the pen drawings of people like Howard Pyle, W. Heath Robinson, that's W. Heath is separate word, H-E-A-T-H. Uh, Robinson, who uh, did some incredible drawings. You can see a lot of influences that Mobius had, for those who know who Mobius is. I think even actually Mobius was very influenced by, I, it only occurred to me recently, uh, Robert Crumb's inking style when he was doing it in the late, uh, probably 60s and 70s. I mean, I can't prove that, but that's what it looks like to me. Probably had a lot of influences. And it came together in his thing, so I always loved Mobius since first seeing it when I worked on this animated film, Rock and Roll. I think it was the art director man, the Frank Nissen, who showed them to me in, in uh, Mobius's drawings in Heavy Metal magazine, the French edition. Okay, I'm yakking, but I want to round out to finishing this. We need something up here now. This is too empty, and let's get to his head, and I'll probably come back here a bit later and dither around with it, but um, let's make this bigger. Like I said, I can feel this paper almost tearing when I when I go heavy with the pen on it. And what you want for, yeah, it's got crud on it. What you want with uh, pen drawing is, I should have gotten a better, harder paper. It doesn't have to be rock hard, but it has to have enough, like absorb the ink nicely, but uh, not, if you go, tough on it you don't want the paper to be going flying away and then when you erase of course um what do i need here some contour lines just to make it the form better i need an element here of some kind let's do some kind of seam If these are three-dimensional, let's get some shadows on them. Just checking my time here. Oh, this is a long one. All right, let's get this finished. I'm throwing some dark slightly darker tones here so that I can get this hand kind of popping out. This is almost making like a mid-tone.
Okay, I'm gonna get this finished. All I'm gonna do is take my chunky, chunky marker here and so I don't ruin my backing paper too much, I'm gonna just start crunching in with this. I'll try and steer clear of that moon. To try to go everywhere at once with this, kind of balance this out. bit of air here and there around that moon. But I'm implying of course that the light's coming lighter. I'm trying to kind of even out these patterns enough that they flow, at least that they look pleasing enough. Leaving a bit of air there as we get closer to this robot. get this more solid black. I have some areas where it's just really dark and punchy. The question is always when to stop, like I've said in some of my other videos. <laughs> too much, too little. Balance is what you want. And uh, I think what I want to hear is just a bit more here coming to bring our eye down. And, uh, I'm just tapering this off a bit to soften it a bit. 
better and I'm going this behind so you can see that it's behind the open mouth there this robot and it's kind of, I guess it's kind of making the effect of a moonlit night where there's a haze and the um, the uh, kind of moonlight effect is spreading in a sheen through the haze I'm just doing this so it butts up against this to give the impression that it's actually crossing behind. As they go far away, which so these would be farther away, I'm making finer lines. This is a little too eye-catching, so I think I'll just darken that. Always seeking balance. I'm always stepping back and analyzing where's the attention going. So when you sort of defocus your eyes a bit, you kind of look like, where is your eye drawn to? And you want it drawn to the places you want it to be drawn to. And you want the drawing to read clearly right away. You don't want people to be struggling to be like, hey, what the heck is that? You want readability. Mystery where you want the mystery. I'm just using this bigger marker to chunk in some of these. It takes too long with that smaller one. Now that I know where they're where they go, I'm just gonna make him a little more solid black, but not kill it too much. I can get away with some darks in there. I need more lighting on that, on that head. There's not really any proper lighting. Here I'm putting these hatching lines completely at a different angle on purpose so that you can pick them out. If I did them sideways, they would join in with this background line work. So that's about clarity. And uh, hopefully that's reading. It's getting, I'm almost at the end here, so it's fun. It's fun when you've got the basic thing working and you can then kind of noodle it in. Well, noodle actually might not be a good word because I don't know if noodling is good. We'll have to have a, a jury trial and decide that. Doing this to suggest a rounded edge there, it gives it more volume. It's too flat and stark, that edge. Let's suggest some three-dimensional form here. My poor pen is clogging up again. Come on, man. Don't do this to me when in my video. Okay, we're almost there. Let's make the far side of this more because in fact, his skull would be wider. It's too narrow. It's really shattered up there, poor guy. I don't know why they'd have teeth, but you know, when you draw this kind of stuff, sometimes you can't get over, <laughs> over fussy. You know, otherwise you get to be like, you know, he really wouldn't have teeth. And you have to get into a complex argument about why you might. And I just want to draw a cool robot that's dead here in the valley, forgotten. And a wanderer, an archaeologist is going to come across him. Is he an Indiana Jones type? I don't know. But he's going to discover this whole valley full, filled with these dead bots. And then mayhem will ensue. Let's get some more something here. A lot of times, a lot of this is intuition. If your intuitions are nagging at you, it's like, mm, that doesn't feel right. You kind of try to learn when to act on it and when to leave it alone. Because, of course, sometimes your intuition isn't right. And then you you, you bung the hell out of it and you mess it up. And, uh, I mean, there was white out invented. You can't do that. I'm not a purist where it's like, 
can't do that. I just try to do these to challenge. I started doing these to, and I, I know other artists do this. I've seen videos and things, notably the famous Kim Jong Gi, um, and others. But uh, yeah, you do it to challenge yourself. But you know, you can always go back and change it. I, I do that digitally sometimes to these. And I feel like this is too light because we've got a moonlit thing, but I'm probably going to leave it alone because I want to end this video. It's almost an hour. And anyone who stayed with me, I thank you. I hope you find it interesting. I'm going to do a few more minutes provided my video holds out. But uh, after that, yeah, that'll be finito. That's a little better because it feels like a shadow coming down. Like I said earlier, what it is is finding out where to stop. Like how much is the right amount. What I was doing in the earlier part of the drawing was figuring out the composition and the basic lines. And, uh, you know, lines, forms, shapes, whatever. But then now, as I progress towards the end, I'm, as you can see, I'm dealing more with the lighting. You don't want to put all the lighting in too early because you might make a big mistake before you've really drawn it properly. I mean, at least that's the way I do it. Let's get some rivets in here. And, you know, I'm using broken lines in places. You don't have to make every line a closed line. This is like another really important secret. Uh, I get ribbed because I always talk about Alex Toth, but I'm going to talk about Alex Toth. Like, if you look at his art and other people, they, uh, they do not close off their line. This thing's stopping. They don't close their lines off in every last bit of the drawing. You leave some gaps and some air because it, it gives it life. That's like a big tip. It, when you get too fussy and every draw, um, every line has to be, like, exactly nailed in, um, it just kind of kills it. Or it can, you know? So, again, these are all choices, but uh, I like to follow that. Like, leave a bit of air. Um, this is like suggesting some gouges. I felt like it needed a bit more. Yeah, almost there. Should I put some kind of night bird? Why not? It's a cheapo element. I probably use it too much, but it also always gives that kind of like activity and something's happening back there. I feel like these lines need more weight. Maybe I'll need I use my thicker marker. I'm putting it up vertical so I get on the point of it more. And again, my annoying paper is catching a little bit, which is not good. Note to self, use better quality paper. I just grabbed this. I have a whole stack of different things in a bin, and I just grabbed this because I got inspired and wanted to do this video. Really, it's just fun making up all this stuff. Like, why not? Let's get some chunky bits here, just to... That was just a bit too much of a gap there, I felt like. See, this is the principle I was saying, like, see, I did these kind of rougher, but still carefully enough, I mean, if you look at inkers like Joe Kubert, he's just great for that. It's that principle I was talking about, um, about like John Singer Sargent earlier, painters. You can leave some stuff rougher. And it's very hard to learn that because you get thinking you have to make every bit dialed in and nailed in. But in fact, you learn that you can get away with some really rougher, chunkier stuff as long as you have other areas that satis <coughs> satisfy the viewer's eye, like that have more finer detail and hatching and stuff. Right now I'm just balancing some of these edges and the way they taper, the lighting fades as it rounds around the form. If 
feel like this is a little too regular, so I'm just kind of roughing it up a bit. Yeah, like it was a little, this is a dead robot. He needs to have a more broken up um, feeling to it. Sometimes, like I said, I'm, you can't see me because I'm not in the video. I'm back here, but I, I sort of lean back and look at it from a distance. Another great trick is to look at the compositions upside down, and then you can see the flow of the patterns and things. Same thing as you can go, see, like when I look at this, I notice I want to do that a bit more. Um, you can go across the room, or if you're on a computer, shrink it down really small and see if it still reads, it, it, because it should. If it, if it, you reduce it down or look at it from a distance and it's an incomprehensible mess, then you're in trouble. It needs readability. So um, I don't know how well I scored in that factor, but that is still a rule. See, when I'm looking at this upside down, I'm seeing that I'm feeling like I should do these things. Don't worry, I'll turn it back. But I often do do that when the drawing's developed enough is just work on it upside down because it makes me notice things like I feel like I need something there. neck here, more dark, to carry that neck through. Okay, how's that? This needs more contour lines. Okay, yeah, to make it more cable-like. Poor robot. All right. See what I mean about doodling, noodling, but which one are, how much is an improvement and how much isn't? Finding the stopping point. I could probably go on a bit, but I'm going to sign it. And uh, there we go. Zoom in a bit.